Hi. Did you get an idea about what this particular program is going to be about from that intro? We're going to be talking about the United States of America. We want to honor our country and also a big thank you to those that are serving in the military and those that have served in the military. So there's going to be a lot of information today. In fact, I'm going to start off with trivia, and then from there we're going to have facts given to you that you might not know, you might not be aware of, and it's our history. And I'm going to start with, I just happened to run into a 12-year-old boy whose name I am going to withhold. I asked him, what country do you live in? And he said, well, that's obvious, isn't it? And I said, I don't know. What's your answer? And he said, Ohio. Twelve-year-old student does not know that Ohio is a state within a country. Please help our kids to learn about our country. In fact, one of the things I want to show you, and I would ask you, Show this map to children, school-aged children, and ask them, where is our country? Can they pick out the United States of America from all the other countries that are on the map? And then, go one step further. Show them a map of the United States and ask them, what state do you live in? Do they know? Please, we have got to work on our history. In fact, we have to protect our history because there are those that are trying to change it. And I, for one, do not want to see our history be changed. And I'll put in a, a plug because an expression is, if you tell a lie loud enough and long enough, people will believe it as true. For example, Separation of church and state. What document does that appear in? This is the start of our trivia. Do you know where that was written? Do you know who was the one responsible for writing it? Separation of church and state was written by one of our four parents. And it was written in a private letter to his wife. Now remember, our history, remember, our forefathers came to this country for the explicit purpose of having the right to worship God according to the dictates of their minds and their hearts and what they believed the scriptures were teaching. So why, why, is separation of church and state automatically now saying, oh, you can't have people be Christians and be in the government. Oh, you can't talk about Jesus. Oh, no, you can't do this, that, and the other thing. No, that's unconstitutional. And how many people know what the Constitution really says? I was debating about reading the Constitution. I thought, no. I want to challenge people. In fact, I, I really would like a response, if you would, um, to see if you have the answers to some of the trivia questions today. Please contact us, okay? The address is Sojourners Along the Way, 507 Richland Avenue, Suite 100, Athens, A-T-H-E-N-S, Ohio, 45701 and Sojourners is spelled S-O-J-O-U-R-N-E-R-S, -E Sojourners, meaning a person that is going along a way. That's why it's called Sojourners Along the Way, because we are all on a journey. So how many questions are you able to answer? And then please, please, please help children that are in your life, whether they're your own personal children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, whatever. Help them to learn our history, our real history. And I want to put in a plug for a book. I used this book before. It's called America's God and Country. It's an encyclopedia of quotations. 
This book contains information from our legal documents. It's primary sources. So you can quote from this book and you're actually quoting our primary sources, which is an important thing for children to learn how to do, to document the things that they are saying, they're writing for school. Don't just go by what you have heard. Ask people, what's the documentation? Where is that written? Okay, so starting off with some of their trivia questions. Did you know that we had a president who was a bachelor the entire time he was in office? And he was the only one who was ever in that status, a bachelor. Who was it? If you said James Buchanan was the only U.S. president to remain a bachelor, you would have been correct. And if that looks like a, a puzzle piece to you, it is. Um, this is from a, one of those calendars that has interesting trivia information, little tidbits. And so I pulled some of them out to share with the viewing audience. Next question. There were three of the first five U.S. presidents who actually died on July the 4th. Can you name one of them? Can you name two? How about all three? Three of the first five U.S. presidents died on July 4th. Do you know what the first five presidents, do you know who they are, were, excuse me? Can you name them? How many presidents can you name? How many presidents can the children name? Three of the first five U.S. presidents who died on July 4th, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson in 1826, and James Monroe, 1831. The deaths of Adams and Jefferson in 1826 occurred on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of the Declaration of Independence. When was the Declaration of Independence written? Do you know that answer? There were two people that signed the Declaration of Independence on July 4th. Can you name them? Can you name other people that signed the Declaration of Independence? How many people actually signed the De Declaration of Independence? If you have these answers, please, please email. That email address is sojourners, the number three, dot tv at gmail.com. Sojourners, again, is spelled S-O-J-O-U-R-N-E-R-S -E at the number three dot tv at gmail dot com. I would love to hear your answers and no cheating. You're not allowed to look them up and then send the answers in. You have to give your responses, okay? I wish I could offer a prize. I don't know, I'll have to talk to the executive director and see if we have something that we could use as a prize for somebody that gets the answers correct. But then you have to give an affidavit that you really did have the answers and didn't look them up your, and then send them in, okay? All right. Only two people signed the Declaration of Independence on July 4th. John Hancock and Charles Thomas. Most of the rest signed on August the 2nd. You know how long it took for all of the signatures to be added? It took five years. It took almost five years for all of the signatures to be added. And we think it was all done on July the 4th. What year? What year was the Declaration of Independence written? And who was the one, do you know this, who was the one that said, I am going to write my name so large that the king will be able to read it without having to use his spectacles? And I paraphrase that. 
Do you know who said that? John Hancock. In fact, it was an expression that at one time when you had to sign a legal document, sometimes people would say, please put your John, John Hancock on the dotted line, which I don't think it was ever a dotted line. It was just a straight line. But anyway, we used to say John Hancock as another way of saying your signature. And here's a cute one. See, I grew up in New Jersey, had lots of relatives in New York, so we used to, to go from New Jersey into New York, especially Long Island, and many, many, many times we would take the ferry across. And there's a lady in the harbor, as she is sometimes called, or was called, I don't know if it's still used nowadays or not, but Lady Lip Liberty, the Statue of Liberty. Do you know how wide her mouth is? Her mouth is three feet wide. Three feet! But when you look at it, it's definitely in proportion. Three feet. I thought that was fun. So, hope you enjoy those trivia questions. I do have some others that... Uh, I'll try to intersperse during this program. But I did want to start with a quote from this book, again, to show we need to learn what our documents say and what our rights really are, because there are a lot of people that are saying, oh, you can't do that. And I had, I had, had this book for a number of years, and I decided that I was going to look at the first um, entry into the book. So this is the first entry. It's called the School District of Arbington Township, Pennsylvania, prior to 1963, endorsed the public school policy stating, each school shall be opened by the reading without comment of a chapter in the Holy Bible. Let me say that to you again. Each school shall be opened by the reading without comment of a chapter in the Holy Bible. Now, it's not that long ago that the Bible used to be read in public schools. I can remember that. I can remember my teacher reading the Bible. I can also remember in public schools, please, not in a private school, in a public school, prayer being said, and there was no problem with it. It is a constitutional right. Continuing on, participation in the opening exercises is voluntary. The student reading the verses from the Bible may select the passages and read from any version they choose. They said he chooses. We're updating that. There are no prefatory statements, no questions asked or solicited, no comments or explanations made, and no interpretations given at or during the exercises. The students and parents are advised that the student may absent himself from the classroom or should he select to remain, not participate in the exercises. But schools used to start with the reading of the Bible. How many schools, public schools, do that nowadays? I thought that was interesting as the first entry in this book. There are over 130 pages of just notes documenting what the original source these things came from. So I would like to advise you Please find out what our primary sources are. Find out what they say. And then let's say to the government, we want these things upheld.
to do a little bit about Francis Scott Key. I am very thankful for those that gathered together in the material and I hope you will enjoy this segment. Uh, there's a lot of things to learn about him and a lot of things to learn about the most famous work that he composed, the one that became our national anthem. What is the title of it? How many verses were there? That's more trivia questions for you. Please, again, send those answers in. I would love to see who knows the answers. If you want to send something, the physical address is Sojourners Along the Way, 507 Richland Avenue, Suite 100, Athens, Ohio, 45701. Or if you're into email, you can email to Sojourners, the number three, dot tv at gmail.com. Love to hear from you and I'd love to hear your um, desires for programs if you would like to do a program. People from time to time have done that and I really want to encourage you. We want to hear different voices, okay? Oh, thus be it ever, when free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must, when our cause it is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. Francis Scott Key was born on his family's estate near Frederick, Maryland in 1779 to a distinguished family of patriots and lawyers. When he was 10 years old, little Frankie, as he was called, was sent to Belvoir, a quaint brick mansion six miles outside Annapolis. Key's grandmother, Anne Arnold Ross Key, had been born to wealthy English parents and early in life developed a strong will and inspiring determination. When her family home caught fire, a youthful Anne raced into the burning building, attempting to save two of the servants. Thick, toxic smoke and searing heat scorched her vision. She emerged from the wreckage, totally blind. Anne's courage and faith never faltered in the long lives that followed and as young Frankie sat reading to her in the hard-polished wood parlor at Belvoir, he couldn't help but be influenced by her incredible resolve and devotion to God. 
If a woman who lost her sight can still see the purpose in life he must have contemplated, then perhaps the power of faith is a force worth exploring. Over the next seven years, young Frankie received an excellent religious as well as liberal education. At St. John's College in Annapolis, he studied Latin, Greek, mathematics, and navigation. But his special interest was poetry, and throughout his life, Key would use his natural gift to court lovers, celebrate friendships, and express a deeply felt religion. Key became a successful lawyer and developed a strict devotion to the church. He conducted family prayer twice a day, taught Sunday school, and wrote an essay examining the connection of literature to religion. He even considered entering the ministry. But by 1814, the War of 1812 had reached its climax. The British destroyed Washington, leaving the capital in flames as they drove north, threatening the port city of Baltimore. When his friend, the eminent physician William Beans, was captured for imprisoning three of His Majesty's soldiers, he and a prisoner exchange agent were sent to negotiate Beans' release. Under a flag of truce, Key and the agent, Colonel John Skinner, met the British fleet in the Chesapeake Bay, near the mouth of the Potomac. The negotiation was successful. The British agreed to release Dr. Beans, but they did not permit the negotiating party to leave. The fleet was preparing an attack on Fort McHenry, a tiny star-shaped fort protecting Baltimore. Key, Skinner, and Beans were confined to their sloop under the guard of a frigate. In the early twilight of September 13th, in the midst of a torrential rainstorm, the mighty English fleet opened fire on the much smaller American fortress. From over the ramparts, Key watched helplessly as a deadly shower of rockets and bombs, some weighing as much as 200 pounds, exploded in and about and above the fort. Just before dawn on the morning of the 14th, the shelling stopped. He and his friends waited anxiously for daybreak to tell the fate of the fort. Dawn's early light revealed a marvelous sight, broad stripes and bright stars streaming gallantly in the wet air through the smoke of the aftermath. Our flag was still there, Key would later write. The Americans had triumphed. In this moment of excitement, Francis Scott Key wrote down his immediate impression of what he saw and what he felt. It was spontaneous and from the heart. He titled the piece, Defense of Fort McHenry. The country would come to know it as the Star Spangled Banner. Following the war, Key continued a successful career in law and was appointed district attorney in Washington. In January of 1843, despite being troubled by a sore throat, Key, now in his 64th year, took a business trip to Baltimore. At his daughter's house, his sore throat developed into pleurisy which quickly advanced to pneumonia. Francis Scott Key died on January 11, 1843, leaving behind his wife, eight of 11 children, and a poetic account of history that would unite his country in song. Oh say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched? were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. The name of our national anthem is the Star Spangled Banner, Banner. and it was written on September the 20th 1814, but it took a long time to actually be named as the National Anthem. Do you know when it was accepted as the National Anthem? Trivia question for you. I'm going to try and read this because every time I tried to practice it, I wanted to sing it, but I want to read you the verses. Oh, an answer to one of the trivia questions. There are four verses, and they're long verses. Oh, say can you see, by the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars 
through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. On the shore, dimly seen through the mists of the deep, where the foe's haughty host in dread silence reposes, what is that which the breeze o'er the towering steep as it fitfully blows, now conceals, now discloses. Now it catches the gleam of the morning's first beam, in full glory reflected now shines on the stream. Tis the star-spangled banner, O oh, long may it wave, o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. And where is that band? who so valiant, buoyantly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion, a home and a country should leave us no more. Their blood has wiped out their foul footsteps pollution. No refuge could save the hireling's contribution. From the terror or flight or the gloom of the grave, and the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Oh, thus be it ever when freemen shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, May the heaven-rescued land Then conquer we must, for our cause is just, and this be our motto. In God is our trust, and the star-spangled banner forever shall wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. I need to add a footnote that one word was changed in the song because it needed to be modernized from when it was written in 1814. I changed the word to contribution. How many people knew that there were four stanzas to this song and how many people realized that even back then we were declaring that our motto is in God we trust or as it is stated here in God is our trust our country did have very Christian roots they're still our roots and there's still an opportunity for us to get back to those strong roots. Our country is in trouble, and a lot of people don't realize how much trouble we are in. And I will go so far as to say that we will be judged for the things that we have allowed to happen in this country. Maybe not now, but you see there is an eternity and that's a long time. And we are going to give an account for what we have allowed, for what we have disallowed. And I want to see the United States return to being a superpower. But when we have students that are graduating from college, I used to say high school, but it's college now. When we have students who are graduating from college, who cannot write a decent sentence, there's something wrong with our educational system. When we have students who cannot recognize the United States of America on a map, we're in trouble. And this actually did happen. Um, I was at Alden Library having 
a, how should I say it, a discussion with somebody and the person piped up with, and what about my amend, my, my right to do, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. what about my Fifth Amendment? She didn't even know which amendment gave her the freedom of speech. Do you know which amendment that is? How many amendments are there? How did they get started? Where were they first written? I hope you have answers for these questions because there's a lot more. And what is happening presently in our country, we're a laughing stock to this world. If you don't like the president, that's your privilege. You have that right because you were born or, or you became a, a citizen in this country. You don't like him, that's your choice. But you need to be respecting the office. And I, for one, am very sad for the things that I see going on and people not realizing that it's by virtue of you living in this country that you have the right, as a citizen of this country, you have the right to do that. I will challenge you. You've heard me say on other programs, I have lived outside the United States, worked outside the United States. Go live in another country. Work in another country. Just do it for one year. And then after a year, come back and see if maybe your attitude will have changed. We need to be respecting this nation. I want to see that come back. Moving on. I hope you will enjoy the little segues. There's going to be music, our patriotic songs interspersed between different clips. So I hope you enjoy them.
bless America. trivia from America's God and Country, an encyclopedia of quotations. How many presidents were assassinated in office? Did any others die in office? Send me the answers. I'm going to read about two of the people that assumed office after the death assassination of a couple of our presidents, okay? Andrew Johnson, the 17th president of the United States, had been President Abraham Lincoln's vice president. Andrew Johnson assumed the office of the presidency when Lincoln was shot. Andrew Johnson continued Lincoln's path of reconstru reconstruction of the South and pardoned those who had succeeded, seceded. This is a quote from Andrew Johnson. I do believe in Almighty God, and I believe also in the Bible. Another quote. Let us look forward to the time when we can take the flag of our country and nail it below the cross, and there let it wave as it waved in the olden times, and let us gather around it and inscribe for our motto, Liberty, and union, one and inseparable, now and forever, and exclaim, Christ first, our country next. This is from Lyndon B. Johnson, the 36th President of the United States, assumed the position of President after President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. In his inaugural address, January 20th, 1965, President Johnson said, If we fail now, we will have forgotten that democracy rests on faith. For myself, I ask only in the words of an ancient leader, Solomon, who, by the way, if you don't know, Solomon was one of the kings of Israel, and what he said is written in the Bible. And this is President Johnson quoting Solomon. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. Come now, let us reason together. Our presidents use the Bible to lead this country, many of them. I don't know about nowadays, except I do know that uh, President Trump has gone on record as saying 
that something that this country needs now to become great once again is, can you fill in the blank? I think I kind of led you up to it. He said, we need the Bible. And I would give him a very hearty amen on that. We need to get back to the Bible. Did you know that they used to use the Bible to teach reading in schools, in public schools? The Bible was used to teach reading, memorization. Please, let's help our country. Please, mark your calendars now. There is a great event that's going to be happening in Athens, Ohio, September the 14th through the 17th. The Wall That Heals will be located at Bicentennial Park, Ohio University, September the 14th through the 17th. The Wall That Heals is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, but they made a, a miniature model of it. It's a half-scale replica of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And that will be coming to Athens, Ohio, September the 14th through the 17th. And a neat thing about it is they will have an exhibit that is open 24 hours during that time frame. So please save those dates and come to Athens. That's a great time to come to Athens. It's my favorite time of year because the landscape explodes in vibrant colors. You have never seen colors on the trees that we have here in Athens and Ohio. And for somebody that was not born and raised in this county, that's quite a statement. So take me up on that. Check it out. So if you want more information, Dave Edwards, Sr., is the director of Ohio University's Veterans and Military Student Services Center. You'll have his contact information very shortly. own executive director of ACTV participated in a motor brigade with the Vietnam Memorial when it was on um, route here in Ohio, not in Athens, but in Ohio. He did it for two different locations. So please come and check it out. Let's honor our military and, and we really need to respect the veteran the Vietnam veterans.